Hello! In this video, we're going to be talking about isomorphisms of groups. Isomorphisms are a very useful and important idea in our study of groups. And we will... As we will see, isomorphisms are a very useful and important idea in our study of groups. What we'll do in this video is introduce some vocabulary. Uh, we'll know what an isomorphism is at the end of the video. We'll talk about what it means for groups to be isomorphic and how to write that. And we'll talk about what it means for a map to be operation preserving. We'll also talk about how to show that a map from a group G to a group H is an isomorphism. And we'll talk about how to take an isomorphism and use a little bit of information about it to determine more information about it using this operation preserving property. To introduce the idea of an isomorphism, I want to remind you that sometimes we mean to say the same thing, but we end up using different language. For instance, the three sentences, hello, today is Tuesday in English, hola, hoy es martes in Spanish, and hola, hoje é terça-feira in Portuguese, are saying the same thing. They are saying in English, hello, today is Tuesday, in the languages of, of Spanish and Portuguese and English. Now, you'll notice that each of these sentences has, each of these pairs of sentences has the same structure. You have a word corresponding to hello, a word corresponding to the idea of today, a word for is, and a word for Tuesday. The only difference is the language that we use, the individual words in these different languages. In the same way, when we talk about isomorphic groups, it might be helpful to think of them as groups that have the same form. That's what isomorphic means, but stated in different language. As our first example, let's take a look at these four groups. All of these groups have order four, and you'll notice that the Cayley tables of each have exactly the same structure. As you take a closer look, you'll see that the uh, Cayley table for Z4, the integers mod four under addition, has this diagonal stripe pattern, and that same diagonal stripe pattern happens in each of these other Cayley, Cayley tables as well. Now, if we were to take a look at a sentence here, like two times, or two plus three is equal to one, we could imagine that these are saying the same things just in different language. And when I say two plus three equals one, in the language of this group, the elements one i minus one minus i under regular multiplication, I would be saying negative one times negative i equals positive i. If it were the case that two gets translated into the language into this language as negative 1, and 3 gets translated into this language as minus i, and 1 gets translated into this language as i. Now if we had a, a dictionary for translating between each of these different languages, we could take any sentence that we say in the language of one group and translate it into a corresponding sentence in the language of another group. So because these Cayley tables are the same, we can conclude that they have the same facts, um, if we could set up dictionaries or correspondences between the different elements in the groups, the different words of this language, then we would have what we call an isomorphism. To make that a bit more precise, what we're going to do is suppose that G and J are groups, perhaps like this Z4 and this group of, of complex numbers. An isomorphism from G to J is a one-to-one -one and onto function from g to j that satisfies this condition, phi of a, b is equal to phi of a, phi of b for all a and b in g. We would say that groups g and j are, are isomorphic if there exists an isomorphism from g to j or vice versa. All right, now to tie this to our idea of languages, let's imagine that we did have a dictionary for taking elements in the first group and the sentences you could come up with with them, and translating that into the language of the second group. You would need to have a way of translating each element 
And if we had a dictionary for translating from one language to the other, it would tell us what element in the first group corresponds to what element in the second group. That's what this isomorphism is. The isomorphism is this function that sends things from the first group to the second group. Now, because our function is supposed to be one-to-one -one and onto, that is a bijection. Uh, we need to have exactly one element in our domain mapping to each element in the codomain. And everything in the codomain gets mapped to. There's exactly a pairing of, between the elements of the two groups. Now we need to talk a little bit about this property. Where does phi of a, b equals phi of a, phi of b come from, and what does it have to do with groups having the same structure? Well, we will say that a function phi is operation preserving if it satisfies this property for all a and for all b in its domain. Now let's take a look at where this equation comes from. Let's Imagine that we have two groups, G and J, that are isomorphic. Let's say that their Cayley tables are exactly the same as far as the structure goes. And let's say that phi is an isomorphism. So phi is a way of translating things from the language of G into the language of J. Now, if these groups are isomorphic, and if the Cayley tables are the same, I would expect the thing that A translates to in J to be in the same place in the Cayley table. So I'll write phi of a in that same position as a is in g. And similarly, in the position where b is in g, I'll put phi of b in this Cayley table for j. Now, if I take a look at the entry in the Cayley table in the row corresponding to a and the column corresponding to b, then because this is a Cayley table, of course this element should be a b. What should it be in this Cayley table? Now, there are two ways to answer this. If you think of this Cayley table as just being a translation of this Cayley table into the language of J, then the thing here should be phi of AB, because we're just translating what happened in the left-hand Cayley table. On the other hand, if you take a look at where this box lies in this Cayley table, it's in the phi of A row and the phi of B column, and so what should be in that box is, of course, phi of A, phi of B. Now, the only way these two can both be right, the only way that the two groups can have the same structure is if, is if phi of AB is equal to phi of A, phi of B. That is one way of understanding where this operation preserving condition comes from. Now let's suppose that we have groups that have the same Cayley table structure. The Cayley table is one way of coming up with the map from the one group to the other group we can sort of read off which elements in the first group maps to which elements in the second group. The isomorphisms give us the dictionaries for translating between the languages of these groups. Now, if you take a look at it, uh, you'll convince yourself fairly quickly that this relation of isomorphism is reflexive, meaning that each group is isomorphic to itself. You can simply map each element to itself, and that's an isomorphism. The isomorphism relation is symmetric, meaning that if I can find an isomorphism from G to J, then I should be able to just turn it around and find an isomorphism from J back to G. And the relation is transitive. So if Z4 is isomorphic to this group of complex numbers, and this complex number group is isomorphic to U of 5, then it should be automatically true that Z4 is isomorphic to U of 5. Now these statements are all true, they can be proved if you're careful about it, and you might take that as an exercise. But any relation, remember, that is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive is an equivalence relation. And so group isomorphism is an equivalence relation. While we're talking about Cayley tables, we need to make an important note. As we've seen, if Cayley tables have exactly the same patterns, that can help you decide that the groups are isomorphic, and it can help you decide which elements in the first group get mapped to which elements in the second group. However, just because two Cayley tables are different does not mean that the groups are not isomorphic. Let's take a look at an example. As we've mentioned before, each group is isomorphic to itself, so Z4 is certainly isomorphic to itself. 
However, if I compare this Cayley table for Z4 with this one, you'll see that there are different patterns, and they're not the same patterns. You'll find that uh, the Cayley table for Z4 here has those diagonal stripes we're used to seeing. The Cayley table here does not have uh, that many diagonal stripes. And so you might, if you are not careful, you might say, well, because these Cayley tables are different, then these groups can't be isomorphic. But they are. They're definitely isomorphic. The problem is that the columns and rows in this table are written in a scrambled order, which makes it hard to see the diagonal stripes we're used to seeing. Now, the moral of this story is you cannot conclude that two groups are not isomorphic by comparing a single pair of Cayley tables. You might be able to conclude that one group is not isomorphic to a second if you looked at all possible scramblings of the rows and columns of the second group. But just taking a look at two single Cayley tables is usually not enough to decide whether the uh, uh, groups are not isomorphic. Now, how do you show that two groups are isomorphic? We will answer this question in the situation where we are given an isomorphism. Let's suppose that we are given a function phi mapping a group G to a group J, and we want to prove that it is an isomorphism. For instance, let's suppose specifically that we are asked to show that the map phi of x equals 3 to the x is an isomorphism from the group R of real numbers under addition to the group R plus of real positive real numbers under multiplication. How do we show that this is an isomorphism? Well, we do this by showing that the map phi satisfies the requirements of our definition. As a reminder, we need to show that phi really does map the real numbers to the positive real numbers. We need to show that that map is one-to-one, -one, or injective. We need to show that the map is onto, or surjective. And we need to verify this operation-preserving property. Now, you'll notice down here, I've written it slightly differently. This is because we're going to write it in the notation of the groups we're dealing with. You'll notice the AB on the left-hand side, that operation is happening inside the group G. Now for us, our domain is the reals, and that means that when I put A and B together, I'm going to be doing so under addition. So I'll write phi of A plus B because addition is the operation of R. Now on the right-hand side, this operation is happening in the codomain, the operation of R plus is multiplication, and so we will write that multiplicatively. All right, but this equation is what we need to show happens for all A and for all B in our domain. Let's go through each of these four steps in turn and see what they look like for this specific problem. First, we need to show that phi maps R to R plus. Now, in general, this is what you would need to do. Uh, we need to show that our function maps everything in the domain into the codomain. Now for us, we're just going to observe that the map 3 to the x takes every real number and converts it to a positive number. 3 to the x is always greater than 0. Now this is a property of exponential functions that we'll assume the reader is familiar with already, and it is all we need to do to show that phi does map the reals into the positive reals. Next, we need to show that the map phi is a one-to-one -one or injective function from r to r plus. Now, if you would like, take a look at this uh, reminder of what it means to show that a function is injective or one-to-one. -one. Most commonly, to do that, we're going to show that if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 is equal to x2, where f is our map. For us, with our map phi, we're going to suppose that phi of x1 is equal to phi of x2, and we're going to explain why x1 is equal to x2. Now filling in the details, if phi of x1 is equal to phi of x2, what that means is that 3 to the x1 is equal to 3 to the x2, and taking the logarithm with base 3 of both sides gives us the equation we were interested in. We've therefore shown that the function is one-to-one -one or injective. Moving on, we're going to show that the function phi is onto or surjective. Now as a reminder, what we need to do is show that for every element in our codomain, there is an element in the domain that maps to our codomain element. 
So what we'll do is suppose that y is an arbitrary element of our codomain R plus. We need to show that there is something in our domain that maps to y. Now doing a little bit of scratch work, you might uh, decide what element of the reals when you raise 3 to it creates y. And you'll find that the logarithm base 3 of y does that. So we'll just state that since uh, our y is a positive number, the logarithm with base 3 is defined. It is a real number. And if you were to plug that real number into our function, we would indeed get y out. Therefore, the function uh, phi is an onto or surjective function. All right, now to conclude our proof, we just need to show that the map phi is operation preserving. Remember, that means that for every two elements a and b in your domain, it's true that the function at a, b is equal to the function of a put together with the function of b. For us, that means that we're going to let a and b be arbitrary real numbers, and we're going to plug a plus b into our function, which means we will have 3 raised to the a plus b power. Now, using the rules of exponents that we're going to assume that our reader is familiar with, 3 raised to the a plus b is equal to 3 to the a times 3 to the b, which we'll recognize as 3 as phi of a times phi of b. So we have succeeded in showing that phi is operation preserving, and that finishes our, our proof. We know that phi is an isomorphism. Right, we will wrap up our discussion of isomorphism so with a quick puzzle. Let's suppose that we have two groups uh, that are isomorphic, and we are told this, but we're not told exactly what the isomorphism is. Can we figure out what it should be? So specifically, let's take a look at u of 10, which is the, uh, the set of numbers uh, less than 10 but positive that are relatively prime to 10. So 1, 3, 7, and 9 are the elements. Z4 is the group of integers under addition mod 4, uh, the integers 0, 1, 2, and 3. We're told that phi of 7 is equal to 3, so 7 maps to 3, but we're not told what 1 or 3 or 9 map to, and we want to see if we can figure that out. Now, we're told very little about phi, uh, just that it's an isomorphism and that phi of 7 is equal to 3, but that is enough to get us started. Because phi is an isomorphism, it's operation preserving which means that if I take a and b in the operation preserving statement to be 7, then I know that phi of 7 times 7 should equal phi of 7 plus phi of 7. Now, in u of 10, 7 times 7 is equal to 9, so the left-hand side just simplifies to phi of 9. In z4, 3 plus 3 is equal to 2, so since phi of 7 is equal to 3, that means that the right-hand side simplifies to 2 as well. Now, the operation preserving has then allowed us to conclude that phi of 9 equals 2. And that's something we didn't know before. 9 is going to map to 2. Now, continuing on, we might take that same operation preserving trick and use what we now know about 7 and 9. If I put 7 and 9 into the left-hand side, the operation preserving property requires that this should equal phi of 7 plus phi of 9. I now know what phi of 7 is and what phi of 9 is. So if I put those together on the right-hand side, addition modulo 4 gives me 1. On the left-hand side, though, 7 times 9 in u of 10 is equal to 3. So I end up concluding that phi of 3 is equal to 1. Now, at this point, you can probably guess what phi of 1 will be. But we can also verify it using this operation preserving property. If we put 9 together with 9, we'll get 1 on the left-hand side, phi of 1. And because phi of 9 is equal to 2, on the right-hand side, we end up concluding that phi of 1 is equal to 0. All right, so we are able to take this little bit of information and show what every element of u of 10 is mapped to by phi. The operation preserving property packs up a punch. It gives you a lot more information than you might think it does in the beginning. Well, with that, we have introduced isomorphisms and what it means for groups to be isomorphic. We've demonstrated how to show that a given map is an isomorphism from one group to another. And we've used the operation preserving property to determine the values of an isomorphism for other elements in our group. Great.
If you have any questions, let me know, and I will see you next time.